So I'm, I have to say, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I feel so honored to be uh, in this amazing panel next to Tia and Matthew. I think that's like a dream uh, to be in the same space as all of you. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge that I'm in the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples today. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful to be able to do this work here because Indigenous nations have uh, proven time and again that with other leadership, we can't truly advance, advance on um, climate justice and any sort of racial uh, justice. And all these fights are so connected that I'm particularly grateful to be on this land uh, speaking today and uh, talk a little bit about the organizing that I have done in my background as an organizer and also how that connects to a just recovery. Um, so as uh, was mentioned, I am originally from Mexico. I have been in Canada for about 12 years um, and I have been mostly involved in grassroots organizing for the last six years. And I had this reckoning of realizing that these issues that are global and so overwhelming actually have the best solutions at the community level. So when I figured that out, uh, that's when I started um, connecting with my community here in Vancouver to fight uh, for climate justice. And so I mostly organized with 350 Vancouver and Our Time. Uh, which is a youth-led group that uh, has been championing a Green New Deal for the last two years. Um, and yeah, uh, more, most recently I joined the Lead Now team, but definitely my heart is always in grassroots organizing because I have seen that the best solutions actually come from community-based initiatives. Um, and so um, while I don't consider myself youth anymore, I have been part of those spaces for a really long time. And the one thing I have noticed is that young people and younger generations truly understand that climate justice is an intersectional issue and that we will not have climate justice without gender equality, without racial justice, without disability justice. And that is very uplifting because I think in this realm of environmental, the environmental movement in Canada, we're seeing a real shift uh, for the first time where a lot of uh, people who didn't used to lead are starting to get in positions of leadership within the movement. And I think that's really inspiring. But um, I think this is like why when we heard about the Green New Deal for the very first time, young people really mobilized behind it because it was the very first time we heard of a really bold plan that actually met the urgency of the climate crisis with the same level of ambition and boldness that we had been waiting for for a really long time. Um, and it's no coincidence that, uh, that I was gonna say last year, but yeah, that was almost a year and a half ago, millions of people showed up on the street uh, you know, demanding real climate action. And that was led by young people. And so I think that that intersectionality and the recognition that all these issues are connected was what brought a lot of young people uh, to fight for a Green New Deal. Um, but of course, uh, this year, everything's changed. And I think COVID-19 radically changed our lives, all of us. Uh, it didn't matter what our background was. It, it truly shook up the, the way that we lived our lives. And so I think like any crisis, um, COVID-19 proved that when a crisis hits, it is the most marginalized communities that get hit first and the hardest. And so that connection with the way that climate impacts are already impacting those marginalized communities around the world was a real reckoning that I think a lot of people had for the first time, coupled with the rise of the Black Lives Movement, uh, uh, in the middle of the, of the year. I think that was, again, a lot of people, a lot of governments, a lot of leaders actually for the first time reckoned with the fact that those systems that our society are built upon are systems of oppression that, will, that are basically inherently designed to benefit the people at the top and the 1% and leave everyone else behind. And so while COVID-19 has been definitely a really hard experience on all of us, uh, of course, some more than others, I think that this has just given us an amazing opportunity for the first time to actually make those connections on how to respond to crisis and not only how we respond to them, but how we make ourselves more resilient to future crises. And I think that's where, the, where Just Recovery falls uh, perfectly because a Just Recovery is not just about COVID-19. It's about reconstructing these systems in which 
things like any crisis, like a pandemic, actually affect uh, most people and working people the most. Um, and so to me, like a just recovery, like there are so many principles and so many things that we can talk about. But to me, is it looks like prioritizing people and communities over profit. It looks like having access to healthcare and long-term long-term care being um, public so that we have senior care. Uh, it looks uh, like making all these recovery plans that the government has been doing, making them permanent and not just a response to a crisis, but a permanent thing so that when another crisis hits, we are resilient and we're uh, ready to, to tackle it. Um, to me, it looks at tackling the climate crisis at the same time. It doesn't mean putting a pause on that crisis because this one is more urgent. Ultimately, they are so connected that you have to do it at the same time. And while we're seeing things like climate plants come up, we're not being ambitious enough because if we continue to expand the fossil fuel industry, it doesn't matter how many carbon taxes we put on. It doesn't matter um, how many nice words we say to the media if we're not planning for the future and the, and the long-term effects of it. Um, and so to me, like there are so many ways to do that, but one of it is a wealth tax. I mean, I think seeing that when the 1% contributes their fair share, we can actually move ahead with all these things. COVID again has proven that we do have the money. It is there. So whenever we hear, oh, but how are we going to pay for it? Oh, the Green New Deal is so expensive. How are we going to pay for it? It has been proven. We can pay for it. We just need to actually have the will to move forward with those things. And so to me, you know, understanding that under capitalism and colonialism, there's no real justice. And a just recovery is just that first step into getting to a place where we actually have a just society is yeah, like, like a stepping stone towards the long term, a stepping stone towards actually fighting and winning a Green New Deal for Canada and beyond. Um, and so I think that us focusing on how a just recovery is one step towards the larger goal, rather than this is just the immediate solution that we're facing right now, is part of understanding that we have to listen to science, that we have to prioritize the well-being of marginalized communities on the front lines, that we have to respect indigenous rights and sovereignty and no more lip service and reconciliation, and that we have to create, like rebuild our economy so that we create good jobs as we transition away from fossil fuels and all these systems. Um, and so to me, that's what a just recovery means. Um, and I know I, I don't want to speak for all of the young people, but I think I have seen such a shift and um, a hunger for this change that actually prioritizes what our futures will look like, because ultimately, this isn't something that COVID-19 will be over in a couple of years and then that's it. There, there are these bigger threats that we know we're facing. Uh, and so again, I like to think of this as a very first step. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people from younger generations feel the exact same way. Thanks so much, Nayeli. Um, now let's move on to uh, Matthew, you have the floor. Absolutely incredible. I can't see all the participants, but if the participants could see me, they'll, they would have seen me nodding uh, in agreement with, with most of what uh, Nayeli had to say. What a, what a privilege to be here. I want to acknowledge that I am here from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations of the Grand River, as well as the Anishinaabe, the uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Huron-Wendat, the Neutrals, and the many that are here before them. Within the land recognitions that we do from coast to coast to coast, I think it's incumbent on us to never lose sight of how the land recognition and acknowledgement is intrinsically and inherently connected to human rights. And that in that space of, of basic human rights, we still have a two citizenship scenario in Canada under the Indian Act. I want to also acknowledge that before we can embark on the conversation of a, of a just recovery, or a just transition, it's important for me to acknowledge a just condition. And we heard about the, the, the understandings of the intersectional way in which COVID has certainly exposed, but many people in communities who've been marginalized have known for generations. It would be incumbent on me to begin this statement in solidarity and, and join in the outrage that has been reported on the SFU alumni 
uh, Coyote Fatoba, who was racially profiled, reportedly racially profiled by SFU security, carded and targeted by the RCMP, pepper sprayed and tasered in a public space for simply buying food. I want to begin by condemning that, uh, like just unreservedly condemning that, because it's that it's that right to space and being and belonging that I think ought to be at the forefront of our minds, having gone through now this pandemic, having witnessed the capitalistic sacrifice of our seniors, of disabled people, people living with disabilities, of anybody who didn't fit the GDP framework of extractionary labor from a neoliberal state to the working class. And what I mean by that is that at every step along the way, as I've been in the House of Commons, I'll, I'll share with you, you know, an hour ago, I had the pleasure of speaking with my, my seatmate and my sister, Leah Gazan, who has put forward just incredible legislation uh, on a guaranteed basic livable income, recognizing that everybody has the right to live in dignity in this country. She put forward in, in a climate emergency private members bill that was tabled about two weeks ago, Bill 2. Uh, 32 C 232, which which really outlines a framework for indigenous led climate justice. And why that's important is because the Green New Deal conversation, in my opinion, has been by and large imported from a great social movement in the United States, uh, but is not new in Canada. I should note that, you know, as far back in 2015, our party was having very real conversations around the leap and the leap manifesto which talked about this wild and bold idea of having clean air and clean water and a shift towards a caring economy. And I pause because what was sold to us in that election, the sunny ways of Justin Trudeau, the aesthetics of a progressive, or I should say full aggressive liberalism that offered the language of justice without the action that spoke about First Nations reconciliation without actually implementing it and worse, with doubling down on resource extraction at the expense of the ongoing land displacement of Indigenous peoples. There was no real a reckoning, no more real reckoning for me than seeing what had transpired with the Wet'suwet'en, the conversations of, of legal, a lethal overwatch, literally, RCMP snipers trained on Indigenous elders, hereditary chiefs, and land offenders. And it is true that under both liberals and conservatives, particularly as it relates to Bill C-51, any forms of economic disruption have been classified as domestic terrorism, which by proxy has made Indigenous uh, First Nations uh, land offenders and, and peaceful protesters on, on pipelines, environmental activists, racial justice activists, trade unionists, <coughs> all become, in, in legislative language, enemies of the state. And we've watched that uh, unfold, you know, in the last 10 years with I don't know more. We've certainly seen that in responses five years ago to Black Lives Matter. But a beautiful thing happened over the course of this pandemic. We watched a new civil rights emerge around the world in, in a movement for Black Lives in support of Black Lives Matter that recognized that the state monopoly of violence is integral to protecting corporate class and, and financial interest. So, so that's, you know, for me, the basis through which I take this work, uh, recognizing that every step along the way, again, the, the aesthetics of big announcements and supports for people have been muddied by this obsession by the Liberal government for means testing. And in that space of means testing, they constantly go back to this idea that if you are not actively contributing to the economy by way of your, your, your labor, then you're not worth financial supports. They left out students from initial recovery packages. They left out seniors with a paltry $600 over the entire uh, pandemic. If you look at people with disabilities, every step along the way, they worked to exclude people specifically from getting support. And here's why that matters. That matters because if you were to put all the supports combined, and we fought 
for all those groups to push for more. Government came out with $900 a month. We said 2000 that we said everybody, they said the select few, and, and we, we got for as many as we could with this liberal government. Now, um, all supports together, if you were to guess right now what the total is for self-employed and working class people, you know, people put a guess, you could put it in the questions or the comments, but I'll tell you, it's about $100 billion. And that sounds like a lot of money. And that's the frame that conservatives are using right now to push us towards the brink of austerity because they're going to say, well, how are you going to pay for it? But what is not talked about nearly enough is within four days, the Bank of Canada rolled out $750 billion in liquidity supports and what they call regulatory loosening to big banks and Bay Street. What does that mean? Like, what does that mean they rolled out $750 billion? That they created a program called the Commercial Paper Program, where they basically allowed banks to lend you money into existence at an interest rate, even if it's low, by borrowing from the Bank of Canada, essentially, and by borrowing from that fiat currency. And why that matters to me is because when I was in a committee, you know, and I heard them talk about how student debt, uh, it was a study, it was a public accounts committee on student debt, on how it was absolutely gone off the rails, people were defaulting, and they were focused, hyper-focused on the default rate and not on the conditions that preceded the defaults. And so I put the question to the parliamentary budget officer, when you give away or when you create or when you borrow into existence $750 billion to banks in Bay Street, how do you reconcile that when you're having, you know, the, 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 the burden of student debt in the tens of thousands of dollars on young people? And their response was, if we gave to everyday people in the same way, it would cause inflation. Well, guess what? The $750 billion, the access to big programs like the wage subsidy, the rent subsidy, yes, it helps small businesses and that we, that's what we fought for. But by and large, it was the giant mega corporations who accessed this money and what did they do? They, they took a billion dollars in direct funding from the government and they paid out $5 billion, $5 billion in dividends to the investor class and the Bay Street class of this country. So these systems, you know, when you look at things like monetary theory, uh, modern monetary theory, and the ability for us to have sovereign currency, and the, abil the ability for us to transition to a caring economy, if we had a guaranteed uh, basic livable income, we can have a just transition for workers because they wouldn't have to be stuck with the question of putting food on the table or going into to the tar sands. We could be able to afford for people to have uh, you know, a, a affordable living in, in a way that doesn't gentrify them out of their own communities. The rights to the city is a fundamental question of any just recovery. And when you look at what's happening out West with the rising costs of real estate, when you look at what's happening with the stagnated wages, with the attacks on unions, all of these things are interrelated. So I say all of that to try to get clear about defining the preconditions for what could be called a Green New Deal, which is essentially a transition towards a more caring and compassionate economy into a more democratic economy and a democratic workplace one in which people are not simply valued or given uh, health coverage and pharmacare coverage based on their employment, but that these are identified as inherent rights for all people to live in safety and dignity in a shared prosperity of this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, and I'm I, I'm also very thankful that you raised the um, the issue of the um, way in which the security at SFU handled um, this uh, uh, this incident. And in fact, as soon as I finish here, uh, I'll be have I'll be going into a meeting with the West Coast Coalition Against Racism, and we're going to try and uh, craft a response uh, to this. And so it's a very important issue that uh, we will definitely be taking forward. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Derek, who will engage uh, Thea in uh, in conversation, and then we'll move to question and answer. Um, there are already a couple of excellent questions in the Q&A section, so I just encourage you now to uh, to consider adding to that. It's uh, it's, it's very good. Okay, um, Derek, the floor. 
Thank you uh, so much, uh, Samir. And um, thank you, uh, Thea, Matthew, and Nayeli for agreeing to um, be part of this event. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great panel to start off this series. Um, we wanna kind of have um, a mix of, of academics and authors and activists. And uh, we're really fortunate to have an academic activist, um, author, all, all of the above, um, joining us from the United States. Um, and we're gonna turn to Thea now. We're kind of just gonna do this as like a transition into the Q and A um, segment because um, there's been a few things going on in the United States recently. So to bring Thea into a sort of Canadian based conversation, um, we thought it'd be uh, a, a little much to ask her to, to to tie in Canadian events into the U.S. picture in a presentation. Um, so just do it as a as a Q and A. Um, and I wanted to plug this book uh, right off the top. Um, we have a little um, some comrades I have a little book group here in Vancouver, and either the first or second book we did when we were starting uh, was this one that came out last year, A Planet to Win: uh, Why We Need a Green New Deal. Um, Thea is one of four co-authors and. Each of the co-authors brings their experience as climate justice organizers, housing organizers, um, just activists in general, plus a lot of scholarly rigor um, to this really, really important book. And it's like the perfect size for your local book club. So organize a book club if you don't already have one and, and read read the book. It's really handbook size, um, the kind of thing you can, you can read while planning your next action. Um, and it's really, really important. Um, and Thea, I, I want to get to the questions now. Uh, obviously, we have to start with the U.S. election. Um, you know, Trump is slowly making his way out of the White Office, uh, pouting all the way uh, out of the White House, uh, pouting the whole way on Twitter. Um, but, you know, this is really just sort of one nightmare ending and the old contradictions coming back now. Um, I guess the huge question to ask is what are the expectations from yourself and others um, for the Biden administration, but also sort of how is the post-election debate playing out? I, sh I should mention you're also a member of the Democratic Socialists uh, of America, um, which is an important group now over 80,000 members that ran a lot of candidates under the Democratic Party umbrella and had a lot of success. Um, everyone knows about AOC, but there's a lot of people winning down ballot races. The congressional squad has gotten bigger a lot of candidates who ran on things like a Green New Deal won. Um, so all of that is to say, like, how are you feeling post-election? Thank you for joining us. And, you know, tell us what the Biden administration has in store for, for the world and for, for all of you organizing there. Um, uh, thank you for the... the... Just start with a small question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you for the additional uh, sort of warm introduction um, in addition to Samira's opening words. Um, and I really just want to thank my panelists, co-panelists, Nayeli and Matthew. And a lot of what I'm going to say, I think, will resonate with the conversation and, and I think also show how urgent and connected these ideas are across borders, right? I mean, we're, we're, we, a, a border divides us and, and a border also divides um, the U.S. and Latin America, which is something I'll come back to later. But I think across these borders, there are communities and social movements um, coming up with similar ideas about how to embark on a, on a just transition and also connect those dots between social protest and policymaking. Um, and so I'll, those will be themes, I think, throughout our conversation. But just to address your question, your big question, um, you know, um, how am I feeling right now? I mean, I'm certainly relieved that not only was Trump defeated, but he is now finally accepting that defeat. And we have the Electoral College, um, uh, you know, clear statement. Um, and so we will move on to a Biden administration. But there, you know, that's almost, I don't want to say that's the end of the good news, but in a, in a way it is, right? Because the, the particular Democrat that will be occupying the, the White House is a centrist, you know, with a long track record of neoliberal policies, of policies of increasing mass incarceration. Um, and so he has a very checkered record in terms of what progressives and leftists care about. Um, and he's kind of surrounding himself with advisors and staff that are really holdovers from like the Obama administration and from Clinton onward. And so we're not really seeing a clear break with, you know, the past in terms of the Democratic Party's own neoliberal um, um, past. So that's not very inspiring. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, but I just want to sort of give a big um, overview. 
The other things that are um, complicated are the fact that Democrats ended up not doing very well in terms of the legislative elections, right, in terms of um, Congress. They we don't know what's happening with the Senate yet, which is really important. And for those not super familiar with like the intricacies and very weird system of government we have in the United States, um, we have this bicameral legislature, right? So the Senate um, has is, is vital to whether big policies like the Green New Deal move forward. And we still don't know who will have a majority in the Senate. And we won't know that till January 5th, I believe, because that's real, that's um, dependent on the Georgia, uh, the runoff elections in Georgia. So that's like up in the air. So it's hard for social movements like DSA, which I'm a part of, or Sunrise or any movement to plan strategy because it makes a big difference whether we live under a so-called divided government or Republicans control um, the Senate and Democrats control the House and Democrats control the White House, but there's also a conservative majority in the Supreme Court. So like a really divided government is tricky for big transformative policy. But if we have Democratic control of Senate, there's more room for maneuver, right, in terms of social movement. So that's like up in the air until January. Um, you know, the, it, in this sort of, oh, and one last thing I should mention is that Republicans did very well at the state house level. Um, uh, so there's a lot of states that are now, more states that are now under Republican control. So, you know, it really wasn't a good election for Democrats, right? There was not like a clear sense of like break with Trumpism with, um, with like clear victory of like a trifecta where Democrats would, would sort of govern all branches of, of government. Um, what we have instead is a centrist in the White House and, and unclear control in, in, in Congress thus far. And what the establishment has sort of done, the Democratic establishment, I should say, um, is like blame the left for this, right? They have come out and said that defund the police and um, and the Green New Deal, and they always single out those two, are like the reason why Democrats did badly. And I think it's important to think about what those two demands are, defund the police and Green New Deal. Both of them, I think, are like the among the most um, transformative demands that we've seen take sort of center stage in US politics. They are also both like youth-led multiracial movements that have like lifted up those demands. And that apparently is very threatening to the Democratic establishment, right? Um, there's not really any empirical evidence thus far. I would be, you know, I'm a political scientist. I would be open to some empirical evidence that those specific demands cost specific House member, Democratic House members their, their seats. I'm not, I'm not sure that there's much evidence of that. Um, we do see that that all of the um, uh, all of the the members of Congress that had supported the Green New Deal, that signed on to the resolution, and also supported things like Medicare for All, actually won their seats. What we saw is that centrists lost their seats. And I think we need to, you know, think about why in many cases centrists don't have viable political strategies that address people's like urgent concerns. And that might be some of the reason that they lost. Um, but there's this whole contested postmortem is, is just to kind of give you a taste of, of what that is like um, in, in the U.S. Um, in terms of the other parts of your question, like how how big was, um, how important was like the youth turnout and climate politics to, to Biden's um, victory and what does it mean moving forward? I've said a little bit already about the difficulties moving forward under a potentially divided government with demands like a Green New Deal. Um, you know, it's, it, it, I think that, you know, it's undeniable that there was historic youth, there was historic turnout in general, including Republicans. There was also historic youth turnout, you know, so that certainly helped Biden because youth tend to vote Democratic. Um, we also saw that, you know, the climate climate as an issue has been at the forefront of the minds of Democratic voters like never before. And I think that it's, you know, undeniable that the Green New, all the movements that coalesce sort of under the banner of the Green New Deal are are in are a big part of that. Like Nayeli said earlier, or, or sort of, you know, kind of just relating to something Nayeli said earlier about like a carbon tax, like that's not going to get people out into the streets, right? So it gets people out in the streets and then what affects the sort of minds of ordinary voters who might not be the persons, people in the streets are these big transformative visions like a Green New Deal. So I think that that definitely shaped the primaries for the first time. We, every candidate had to have a climate policy and the climate policies were better than in the past. Um, I was a Bernie partisan. I think his was the best because it was spent the most and had the you know biggest scale of kind of public investment. Um, but, you know, Biden, despite not having like much of a history on the climate issue, did 
it did like improve his climate policies. I'll put it that way. It's a low bar, but he did improve them um, in order to kind of reach not only this youth movement, but also like the the ordinary voters that are now much more concerned about climate. And so he pledged to spend two trillion dollars, and he to 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 lead with public investment um, in in, in um, renewable energy sectors, and importantly, resonating again with with what Matthew and Naomi already spoke about. He says that forty percent of this should go to frontline and disadvantaged communities. It's a clear influence of the environmental and climate justice movement, right? The question is, like, will he do this? The rhetoric is part getting there. The policy goals are getting there. But will he actually put this into practice? And I think, and I'll just sort of close with, with saying this, which is that um, it, it's unclear because the people he's appointing to key positions are not very good. I don't want to get into the weeds of like political personalities in the U.S. for folks who, you know, this may not resonate for, but just just trust me for now when you can do the research afterwards that it's like just folks that, again, as I said, have been in the Obama administration, the Clinton administration. They're just like the people that Biden has relationships with. And they're not people that are rooted at all in like progressive climate policy or, or environmental justice movements. And it's, it's in some cases, it's actually quite concerning in terms of fossil fuel ties or other industry ties of some of the appointments, right? So that's not very inspiring. Um, and I, I then- wanna, Maybe I could um, uh, yeah. just jump in here and- um, Yeah, please. Because I want to ask you about the group in Congress, especially that is so inspiring. Yes, and, and I'm gonna, uh, I was going to get there, but you ask me and I'll, and I'll get yeah, there when you um, ask me the question. Well, first, I mean, because Matthew is on the call, I think we should acknowledge that like there are some e exceptional squad-like members of the Canadian parliament. Like- there's always this discussion on the left, like, where is Canada's AOC? Where is Canada's AOC? Like, you know, Nikki Ashton, Matthew, Leah Gazan, like these people have been there for a while doing the work, like in elected positions um, with social movements. So I just want to say for the Canadian audience, like we should um, value those elected members we have at all levels who really work with social movements. And I wanted to ask you about that part of the squad and, and AOC and the others. What is it about like how they relate to social movements um, that creates this, a, a dynamic that goes beyond whether you win or lose an election? Like everyone, um, uh, you know, just remarks on AOC's political dynamism and like this once in a lifetime uh, charismatic figure. But for me, what really defined her political career was that first day or, or the first week in Congress where she joins the Sunrise Movement sitting in, in Pelosi's office. Like that's just a dynamic we don't see enough of. So if you could talk a yeah. little bit about what makes the squad unique and how a group like yours, the Democratic Socialists, is involved in that. I think that'd be of interest to people on the call. For sure. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's so inspiring to me about the squad um, is that, you know, I have a long sort of history of research and solidarity work on Latin America. And one of the things that's very inspiring about Latin America is that dynamic of social movements and electoral politics. Right. I'm not trying to say it always works out perfectly, but we we have a lot of sort of experience of that in, of, in Latin America. And in the U.S., like for a long time, social movements weren't super oriented to electoral politics, but that began to change. And I want to credit Bernie partly with that, just in terms of opening the possibility that like maybe we can get a socialist in office, right? Even though, so I'm talking about the 2016 primaries. And I think after that, and with the growth of, growth of DSA and the growth of Sunrise and both of those movements having like real electoral aspects to their work, but electoralism, just as Derek sort of hinted at, that is really about getting um, great people in office with social movement ties and then holding them accountable while they're in office and also working with them to kind of feed the most radical policy possible, right? And so what is that particular dynamic between movements and electives? I think that we've been now experimenting with this for a few years in the US and it's, it's just a sea change. I'm 36 and like it, it, it was not like this when I entered left activism, it, you know, in the late 90s. Like we never thought of having anyone in office. And so that's just like a big kind of horizon shift in general. Um, you know, in some cases, we have electeds that come right from movements. Um, and I want to just say Cori Bush is probably the best example of that. Cori Bush comes out of the Black Lives Matter movement. She was politicized, she says in her own words, deeply radicalized by Black Lives Matter. She comes out of organizing in Ferguson. She's also a nurse, so she has that background, right? So we have folks that come from movement right to elected positions. In other cases, like AOC, like Jamal, like Ilan, like Rashida, we have people with a lot of community organizing experience. I, I don't know that we'd say they were like movement leaders, but there are people with that, those backgrounds that then enter into relationships with movements in part through their campaign work. And so that's where I want to pivot to answer your question, I think, quite directly, which is I think 
the most um, the most important thing for movements like DSA, like Sunrise, and they're already doing this, but I would just say, let's do more of it, is to actually like get in at the ground floor and build the electoral campaign, right? Like create the infrastructure within your movement to canvas, to phone bank, to text bank, to do the comms and media work that Nayeli was talking about, like to actually like in-house develop those skills so that elected officials begin to rely on you and you actually have that power rather than it being like you like, you know, begging them to like listen to you, they actually rely on you for turnout, for media attention, for all of those things and sort of flipping that that dynamic that sometimes happens. You know, we've seen a lot with labor unions in the US that they're really not in charge of the relationship with electeds. Like they get, there's been a history of co-optation. I don't want to, you know, deviate too much, but I think what movements have been learning recently is like, we need to recruit from within our ranks as much as possible, but also develop electoral muscle um, and that that infrastructure then stays for the next round. Um, and I'll just say in New York, and, and I'll end here just with a concrete example, New York City DSA, it's astounding what they have done just in a few years. Um, we have now six members of the New York State House of the legislature of New York State, right? Obviously one of the, you know, pretty important and big state economically and politically, six socialists um, in the state house. And their next, New York City's next goal is to get, a, get city, a, a slate of five or six city council members elected in New York City, right? And so it's like you build that muscle. And honestly, the first two campaigns that New York City DSA did lost. But a lost campaign, when you built the infrastructure, then can be remobilized and you grow and then the next campaign wins, right? And so it's not getting, it's like building the infrastructure, not getting too worried if you don't win every race, but like keeping the infrastructure going and keeping that muscle kind of moving um, so that you can kind of, you know, expand to, to different levels of government moving forward. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And Nayeli, who started us off, um, her organization, organization that she's, been part of um, is sort of a sunrise movement within Canada and, mm -hmm. um, and 350 and our times in different locations across Canada had a big impact in the last federal election. Um, I know they supported candidates like Matthew and a number of others who got elected, but really mobilizing a new electorate and taking a new approach um, to politics. So I'm going to, I'm going to flip it back to Samir now. Thank you so much, Thea. Uh, we've got another 40 minutes for, to take some Q and A. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of folks. It's too bad we can't see everybody, or at least on our view here, can't see everybody, but we got a lot more questions. So I'm going to flip it back to Samir to take some of those um, for our three panelists. Thank you again for joining us. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Derek. Um, and thank you, Thea. That was fascinating um, uh, discussion, and um, we'd, we'd definitely like to hear, hear some more. Um, and uh, but let's let's go to a couple of questions, and it would also be interesting if if there's some possibility of the panelists to address one another. For example, Matthew, I'd be delighted to hear what you have to say about the kinds of organizational strategies that uh, uh, that Theo was talking about as well. Um, but let's take a question. Here's one uh, from. Um, a, 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 a good uh, ally of the Institute, a long term, uh, long time uh, SFU faculty member in the School uh, for Communications, an activist, a journalist. Um, this is uh, Robert Hackett. Um, thank you for your and lead now stamina and energy. Have you thought on how, uh, thought, have you thoughts on how a wealth tax specifically works given the mobility of global capital? That's one of the arguments that the neoliberal corporate media make against it. It's too complicated. Um, I, I think that's principally, uh, obviously, um, uh, um, directed at uh, Nayeli, but the others can, can also respond. But Nayeli, uh, let's hear from you first. Um, I think my response can be pretty simple in the sense that I don't see what's complicated when the top 1% is becoming richer every day while working class people are actually struggling, especially during a crisis. I think I read a statistic that um, like the 20 richest billionaires in Canada got like 40 billion richer over the pandemic and that's just Canada, right? So if you put it in, in that perspective, if you just make them pay their fair share, which will still leave them with enough wealth for their lifetime and beyond, and then use that money to support the working class and all these permanent programs that, again, will make us resilient to future crisis. It doesn't seem that complicated to me, <laughs> but definitely it gets um, 
it, it gets seen as a threat uh, and it gets uh, portrayed that way in the media and other spaces because those people who are at the top have an immense amount of influence in government. They have an immense amount of, of like law lobbying power, a lot of influence in the way that our society works. And so, of course, it is framed as a threat because they are the ones who are being threatened and not actually the majority of people who would benefit for, from something like that. So, um, again, we have even heard the Liberal government say that they would support a wealth tax, but I mean, it's been months and years and we haven't seen anything like that. We have seen so much bolder action and response to these things from other countries, like Argentina just passed a massive wealth tax. Um, and so I think it's, it's that like threat to the status quo that is preventing it, uh, it's preventing us from actually moving forward. And the fact that it is threatening the top and those people who have so much power within government because we don't have enough of those progressive figures yet. And so I think that's why, not because it's actually complicated, like to me, it's not complicated at all. It is just portrayed that way because the people who are threatened are the ones who hold the most power. Thanks so much. Um, now here's a question from Clara O'Manic. Um, and it's, it's directed uh, at, at Matthew. Uh, the Liberal Party is really good at co-opting language and faking um, uh, being progressive, which poses specific challenges for organizing and to build public outrage for all of the nefarious things that they do, uh, like the example that you gave of the bank bailouts. Uh, from your experience in government, how can we hold the Liberals accountable and push for meaningful action um, in this government? Yeah, that's a critical question. And I think that 2015 was that, you know, that faux aggressive aesthetics of liberalism, which is identity politics without the class analysis. And they sold it. And a lot of people bought it. But that's done now. You know, like you can only fool me once, you know, and I think that uh, as it relates to things like the wealth tax, one of the most bizarre experiences I have as a member of parliament is watching conservatives and liberals fight over who provides more subsidies to oil and gas, watching them clamor to protect the ultra wealthy in this country. You know, uh, we heard 20 people having amassed $40 billion in wealth. 87 families in this country have more wealth than the body earning 12 million working Canadians. That is obscene. That is a level of, of hoarding of resource and prosperity that is not democratic. And so, I happen to be the critic on, on revenue. I actually would suggest that our 1% flat tax, our wealth tax, is meager, that it's not nearly ambitious enough. And you look at both Bernie and Warren, uh, what the Democratic Socialists of Canada have put together in their call, in their critique on our wealth plan, I tend to agree with that it should be a progressive wealth tax that starts at a much lower bar of wealth uh, because you know the tax burden has been shifted on to working class people corporate tax is 15 percent you know we could have a, a, a big business corporate tax that taxes at the source and for the people who might not be tax wonks i promise you this if any person on this call doesn't file their taxes for three year three years cra will know to the dollar how much you owe. I promise you, they will go into your account and they will take what they think you owe them until you pay. But that is absolutely not the case for the ultra wealthy and the offshore ta tax havens. There are 900 Canadians currently registered on the Panama Papers. So these are things that we have to do when we push back against this kind of faux aggressive veneer of, you know, a government that has the audacity to create a ministry for the middle class and those working hard enough to get there, like, do you know how disgusting and, and patronizing and, and demeaning that is to working class people that somehow it's their fault that they can't climb out of, out of working class poverty? But that's the liberal government we have. The next generation isn't buying it. Thanks so much. Uh, and I think we can um, turn the next question uh, uh, towards Thea, but it really is directed at the panel as a whole, but I think it would be good uh, to start with Thea. Um, and this is from uh, M.V. Ramana, who's a, a colleague of ours at, uh, at UBC and has also done a lot uh, of, of work with the Institute. So how do you think um, uh, 
uh, about the tension between time spent on elections and mobilizing the electorate and the time involved um, in all kinds of other struggles. Um, so yeah, I'll start with Thea and then I'd like to hear from, from the other panelists as well because I think it'd be very germane. Yeah, this is a great question and something that we debated a lot in DSA um, uh, over the past few years when we've been discussing like whether to endorse Bernie, for example, and like thinking about, will that suck up all of our energy into this national political campaign? So it's it's a debate that I'm I'm familiar with, and I think the question is is well posed. I mean, at, at sort of like a really to, to make it very concrete and to simplify it a lot, like on a on a day to day individual level, you can't do two things at once. Like we think that we can multitask, but really we're not. We don't do everything equally well when we multitask, right? So like if I commit myself to multiple campaigns as an individual, like to some you know local anti eviction campaign and to an electoral campaign, I'm probably not going to really devote my time equally. And I think that's the concern that that the question asks we're speaking to like given the limited capacity and resources on the left and in social movements doesn't make sense to focus on both electoral and non-electoral kind of street protests and i guess that you know while at that individual or sort of micro level there is a trade-off i think at the movement level there isn't so much of a trade-off and i think that we need to think more about how these different activities feed into one another and create the skills, the capacities, the infrastructures that lay the groundwork for the next round of struggle, whether that round of struggle is parliamentary or extra parliamentary, right? And so I was telling you before about, about um, New York City DSA and what, um, uh, I'm not a member of New York City DSA, despite being from New York City, I don't, I don't live there. And so I, but I talked to my comrades in it and they say that like, without a doubt, they've become stronger in all of the arenas that they've organized in because of their electoral work, both because it's given them the skills of door knocking, canvassing, phone banking, all of those things. Um, and also because people know about them, like they go down the street and talk to people and they're like, oh, DSA, because like you have that got that person in office, right? So it allows them to have that conversation with community members that they have like a touchstone, a point of reference, which is their electoral work. And then maybe they can move those community members into another campaign, into a non-electoral campaign. So I think it's more important to think about strategically how can for the fight for state power and the fight on the streets interlock and mutually constitute one another rather than though maybe in an individual moment they're opposed rather than see them as, as sort of a zero sum game. Uh, Nayeli, Matthew. Um, yeah, I definitely struggle with this a lot because um, I don't know, maybe this is uh, me being someone who, for example, cannot vote in Canada. I am not a Canadian citizen. And so electoral politics don't represent a big part of the population that ultimately get affected by the results. So I struggle with this because in on one hand, I understand again, the importance of it. But in a way, I think a lot of uh, communities like who are racialized and don't actually have the power to vote see elections as sort of harm reduction. Uh, we see, we know what's at stake. And, you know, if we elect someone like Donald Trump, if we elect someone like the Conservative Party, we know how much is at stake for those communities that even though we don't have the power to, power to elect them, it, it, it effect, trickles down like big time. But at the same time, there is such need for resources and power behind grassroots movements that it is really hard to find that balance. But I do think that you can find that balance, like Tia said, if you actually bring up people from the movement into electoral politics and actually fill those spaces, because then you won't be have you won't ha be have um, you won't have to be struggling between, you know, just basic survival and who we get into office so that we can live versus you know, like actually building power in communities, which is what we need. And so I think that there's definitely a balance to be stricken there. And it is very encouraging to see movements like Sunrise Movement in the US or our time here, where it is young people building that progressive power to, towards the top, bringing all of those values and all of that experience from grassroots organizing, because I don't think they're separate. It's just that unfortunately, the the energy that needs to go into electoral politics is so much bigger and it's taking away so many resources from grassroots so i think there is a balance in there i tend to think that grassroots community-based initiatives are more important just because they represent a larger group of people um and so again i, I don't speak for anyone here but i think as someone who can't participate in electoral politics beyond organizing around candidates that i you know believe in 
it is it is harder to see the effect of that power. And so I think there, there's a balance there, but I, I totally agree with you. There's like, if we merge them together, if we bring people to the movement up to run for office and actually fit those spaces, then I don't think there's like a trade off there. Like you, you actually are being successful in your movement because the people in power respond to you and not the other way around. 100%. I, you know, I come from a place of, 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 of a grassroots organizing and, you know, I, I'll share with you that I just got tired of continuing to have to go to these tables of power and ask them to do the right thing. That it became clear that we needed to stake our claim at these decision-making uh, tables to ensure that our values were represented there. It's the concept of dual power. It's what Thea has talked about in terms of the, the inside and the outside game. Uh, understanding that unless we have you know, radical politics in, in partisan positions, and unless we continue to organize outside of elections, like direct action definitely gets the goods. There's no conversation around reconciliation absent of idol no more. There's no conversation around racial justice absent of BLM. You know, if you look at our time, the day that I was brought in for my orientation, I joined our time, you know, to, to receive my mandate letter from the youth as a constant reminder about the decisions that I will be making in the House of Commons are going to have impacts on generations that are yet to come. That's a powerful thing. And I feel like some people, particularly folks who have been maybe uh, jaundiced by movement politics over the last few decades, there's almost a, like a like a nihilism, you know, a, a electoral nihilism. And I can share with you that that only serves ruling class that the best way to keep the status quo is to keep radical voices out of partisan spaces. But we are pulling, dragging, kicking and screaming the Overton window back to a reset that provides a real left-right center analysis instead of this far-right, neoliberal right, and then, you know, third-way Melbatoast uh, leftist center. Thanks very much, uh, Matthew. Um, Derek, please, you've got uh, something. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to tell a real, a really quick anecdote to, to add to this idea, Nayeli. You said it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. If you get the right candidate, it becomes a huge multiplier. It can become a big multiplier effect. Um, when Gene Swanson was running for city council in the summer of 2018, we just finished a, a campaign event. And I going home for the evening, I was like, oh, what are you doing tomorrow for campaigning, Gene? And she says, oh, I, I think I'm going to go get arrested on Burnaby Mountain. You know, some people are taking action up there. Um, she was in the middle of the election campaign. She wasn't even going to, like, alert the press or do anything. She was just going to go as an activist. Um, so she's a longtime housing and anti-poverty activist who had been convinced to run for city council. Um, and then in the middle of an election campaign, she just felt it was her duty to go and join a civil disobedience against a pipeline, take an environmental action. Um, and so, of course, we were like, well, you've got to tell people, you've got to put that on social media. We're going to like do a press release. Uh, and it ended up not only helping her get elected, she ended up going to jail during the election campaign and then getting elected. Um, but it really helped the movement because then the issue was on the front page. You have a candidate getting arrested, going to jail for the cause. So th this sounds like a joke, but I think seriously, you should find people willing to go to jail for justice and then try to convince them to be movement candidates. Um, and if you do that, uh, like I went back and looked it up after us, has anyone ever been in jail and then got elected? It turns out most of the leaders of the Winnipeg general strike were all jailed. All the big leaders were jailed and they all got elected. They were some of the first socialists ever in parliament for Canada. Um, so this is a model we have to return to. Find the leaders who are willing to risk something and then, you know, let them be the, the activist candidates. Thank you, Derek. That's, um, yeah, that's an excellent uh, anecdote. Um, let's uh, um, open the, the, the floor up a little bit now. Um, I, I think if the, the panelists would like to, to address one another, I think that would be really um, uh, useful. Um, and then there's, there's another question I have. Uh, I think for audience, we have probably a bit of time for maybe one more question after that, and then we can, uh, we can wrap. But I'd, I'd like to allow for, you know, maybe about uh, five to seven minutes uh, where panelists can can address um, uh, one another. So whoever would like to uh, to go first. 
I actually have a question for Thea because uh, she touched on something that I'm, I'm like currently engaged in in Hamilton. In Hamilton, we're blessed to have incredible grassroots organizers, Disability Justice Network, Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, you know, uh, uh, many, many more Black Lives Matter, lots of incredible organizers. And you talked about the Latin American experience where you have kind of, for lack of a better term, inside outside game of, of partisan organizing with movement organizing. I'm wondering if you might be able to draw that out a little bit in a practical term in terms of how decisions are made, how, you know, the theories of change are, are decided on. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, uh, and I'm glad that it resonated and, and, and felt relevant. And I love to sort of think about lessons from the global south for the global north um, and, and not just around this specific question, which I'll come to, but also our ideas for what like a just transition might look like, right? So there's a lot of interesting stuff in Latin America around that right now as well. Um, so there's this whole moment that began with the election of Hugo Chavez and his, his coming to power in 1999 that scholars call like the pink tide, where across the whole region, you had a bunch of left-wing governments in power to the point where in 2010, two thirds of Latin Americans lived under a left of center government. Like it was like a total sea change. Cause like, think about a decade before you had like neoliberal hegemony and a decade before that you had dictatorship. So it was like, how, you know, how did this happen? Like under such difficult circumstances to organize and movements organized primarily against neoliberal austerity. So it's really interesting to hear about Nayeli and Matthew's point like honing in a lot on the on that dogma of neoliberal austerity and how powerful it can also and unifying it can be to organize against it because it affects you know of course disproportionately when we're thinking about race or geography but it affects many people right negatively and so it's like a unifying point and that's how these movements really came to power in latin america was first like they had democracy they were out of a dictatorship so they could contest elections without fear of an immediate coup from the u.s of course it's not like that totally goes away but it's not like you know a situation like in chile in the 70s under allende where pinochet you know so it's a little more freedom for of movement and then you have austerity that's affecting everyone badly and these movements rise up and What's interesting about them, now to answer your question more directly, is they from the get-go are like, we need to take the state. We need to occupy the state. And we need to think of the state as a terrain of struggle um, that we're not going to take over overnight. We're going to get into positions of power. Maybe it's local government, maybe it's national government, but we're going to still struggle against the retrenched right wing and the domestic and foreign elites, right? And so it's very much like this ongoing struggle idea. And also this idea that like once we get into the state, we need to democratize the state. We can't just get there and preserve the power structures that exist. We need to create new forms of participation, new collective rights. So a lot of what happens in Bolivia and Venezuela in Ecuador and elsewhere is like rewriting constitutions, which like in the US would be like unimaginable. The idea that we could have a new constitution ever that wasn't from like the 18th century written by white, you know, slave owning men. But in Latin America, like new constitutions happen more frequently. And so now you have some of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Like Ecuador is recognizes the rights of nature as a legal subject, like nature has rights or indigenous rights, prior consultation. Now, of course, it gets very thorny of when you have the left in power and these very organized movements, what's going to happen? Like, are the movements going to be satisfied? Are they going to keep pushing? Are they going to hold accountable? Are they going to demobilize? And I can tell you that, you know, across all these countries, each of those things happened, right? You know, there was a variety of outcomes in terms of how well movements were able to hold parties accountable um, once they were in power. I will say that just briefly, two just interesting cases. One is Bolivia. Um, wh which, you know, despite, I think, a lot of the reputation that Morales, Evo Morales, the, the, the former president of Bolivia that was pushed out in a coup, had for concentrating power, scholars have shown that actually the party that, that Evo was at the head of involved a lot of organic participation of movements within the party. So one thing to think about with the NDP, not to tell you what to do, and I know you're already thinking about this, is like, how do you build structures where movements can directly participate in the party. You know, how does that actually work? How can they put input into policy making, right? How can they participate in candidate recruitment and selection? And, and some of these things happened in the case of the movement towards socialism, the party in Bolivia. I'll, I'll end it there because I can talk about this stuff forever. But I think, you know, getting into that granularity of how things worked out in different cases is super interesting. I can follow up with you later with some interesting stuff to read, but I think it's a good set of like case studies for the global north left. 
I would also just add um, that momentum within the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn um, serves as an interesting example from within the North as well. Um, and he would have been quite mindful of what was going on in, in Latin America as well. Um, good. Um, Nayeli, would you, do you have a question or a comment to, to uh, uh, one of your fellow panelists? Uh, or also Thea as well, if you, if you have a question or, or further comment about something that came up earlier? I guess I have a question that I would love to hear both Nayeli and Matthew talk about. Um, and I hope this isn't, I don't know, I, like I hope it's like a politic or an okay question to ask, which is like, how would one go about transforming the NDP, both from like an internal perspective, like Matthew being a parliamentarian, and then Nayeli from like a movement perspective, not that Matthew doesn't have that perspective, but like just to hear like two points of view, like how do you pressure this party that has these left roots but has, you know, there's been straying from it. I don't want to get into the weeds and I'm sure the audience is much more knowledgeable than I am about this. But I'm curious, like, what are the opportunities within the NDP and external to it to like put it into a more of a left kind of, like make it a left kind of popular party? Something I've certainly given a lot of thought to. And I, I you know, I turn back to the systems and principles. I went back to the roots of the party. Uh, and looked at how it was formed with the CCF and the CLC, how we got to delegated status, how over the, the 80s and 90s that kind of, you know, and went in a bunch of different directions in terms of organized labor. And the one biggest thing that I would do if I were president of the NDP for a day is I would change the constitution to allow for one member, one vote in a direct democracy on all matters to scrap the delegated system where there is, quite frankly, dead power within the party. And, and that, you know, is going to require a, a lot of work, but it really is about having electoral reform, democratic reform within our own party apparatus that reflects the things that we say publicly around proportional representation in the Canadian politic. So it's that old saying, you know, eat in your own cooking, as, as my Caribbean sisters and brothers and family says. And I think that would be like the first, the first step for me is one, one member, one vote and, and let it return back to a membership-based party. Yeah, I think uh, beyond the NDP in Canada, we have this problem where we don't have proportional representation uh, when it comes to electoral politics. And I think shifting that perspective to encourage more of those grassroots people and organizers to run for parties like the NDP, who definitely align a lot more with the things that, uh, you know, we are fighting for is really important. But then I guess opening it up to actually make it easy for those people running for nominations. Like in BC, we have a lot of like the older guard NDP and like that doesn't change. So as long as that doesn't change, you know, no matter how many people uh, we elect from those parties, like it doesn't actually affect the demands that we have placed there. Whereas if we bring people from the bottom up and the process that the NDP has to make it easier for you know younger progressive older candidates to run is definitely something that would like actually mobilize a lot of those people who are on the left who don't quite see themselves represented in parties here in Canada and I think that's one of those things where like we there are a lot of things that we align with and we say okay yeah you know th this party is do saying the right thing with this issue but then this other party is saying the right thing with this issue and I think Again, if we bring those people from grassroots organizing and grassroots movements up and like able to, you know, easily join these parties and run for office, that's how you're going to get those votes, uh, which is ultimately what we don't have right now. And that's why there's a lot of like, oh, no, like, how do we get how do we make sure that in these elections we get, um, you know, keep this party out? How do we do this? Like, we shouldn't be doing that. There shouldn't be any sort of like strategic thing. We That's should right. be all represented. And so parties like the NDP should definitely make it easier for, for progressive candidates from the bottom up to run for office. I think that would make it so much more encouraging for people who have never done it before to actually go for it. Okay, great. Well, yeah, this, and I, yeah go ahead, Matthew. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I just, I like on that point, I find that a lot of movement organizations they, they follow the same like, praxis and it's not a great theory of change where they wait for an election to happen. They come with like a, a demand or a pledge. They want a politician to hold a sign and say, I commit to climate change or racial justice or whatever. And then that person is either elected or they're not. Um, and then that just kind of goes away after, right? And so like to your earlier point about being embedded in the writing association process, 
to ensure that you're doing the work that might take two election cycles. You know what I mean? It, it might take thinking in a 10 year horizon. I think in a 10 year horizon. You know, I, right now I'm a year into a 10 year horizon about how there's going to be significant systems changes. But if you want to have accountability and influence, you'd be shocked to know how few people decide and determine who's on a ballot through the nomination processes of our, all parties. In any given riding across the country in Canada, you can have under 100 people determine the names of the four major party candidates on any given ballot. That's a thing. And so the only way to disrupt that is to be engaged to sell memberships. It is super simple electoral politics in Canada, but it's not easy. And so you have to engage and be willing to stay with it, even when it disappoints you. Right. There's no perfect politic in anywhere, quite frankly, and and continue to engage in it until you find that that critical path and that theory of change. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're getting into the home stretch. There, there was a question here about electoral reform, but I think the panelists have sort of answered that. Um, so I think we can move to the final question. And then once you've done uh, once you've done answering this question, I just turn it over um, to Derek for any final comments and then I think we'll uh, we'll wrap. Um, so I think this question does relate to what was said earlier, what Matthew had to say, um, just alluding to the Leap Manifesto and, and a kind of politics of care. Uh, but I think this is a good way to, to sort of bring the, uh, the panel to a, a close. And may, maybe you can see this, but I'll read it out in any case. Um, so the panelists have highlighted several issues which the pandemic has revealed, political, economic, ecological, etc. I'd like to add another, the biomedicalization of our lives, which involves a focus on individual physical health while downplaying relational, emotional, spiritual realities. This has been made evident in what has been happening and continues to happen uh, with our seniors and elders. And I think this has a particular tie-in to um, indigenous resurgence and indigenous, um, what uh, both Glenn Coulthard and Leanne, Leanne Simpson called grounded normativity. So relationships, relationships also to the land, which is of course directly related to the pandemic and the, the ecological crisis. So I think this would be a good, uh, good question to end on. So uh, uh, why don't we go back to Thea? Sure. Um, there's a, I'll just um, hype a, a great article from a couple years ago that my, my co uh, friend and, and co-author Kate Aronoff wrote called like, Will a Green New Deal Make Us Happier? Um, it, it, it's something like that. Look, look it up. And it's a really excellent article and sort of gets into what the title says, which is like, how could a Green New Deal build more meaningful social and community relationships, right? Um, in part by, by actually getting us off the treadmill of like hyper consumption and like giving us the time and the resources. So we've already talked about like guaranteed income. We could talk about a job guarantee. We could talk about all these things so that like folks' economic lives are secure and that frees up time for engaging in politics, for engaging in community and for rebuilding like a social fabric that is like beyond tethered at this point. I mean, in terms of like a tattered, I should say, like in terms of the, the pandemic and just how much of our lives are virtual now. And so I think it's, it's a real moment for the left to actually speak to like social connectedness and the importance of it. And I think in the U.S., the 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 not not like the radical left per se but like the kind of like i don't know like like just in general the like liberal left has really like lost this culture war with the right like the right has managed to like make covid into this culture war and what liberal elites say is like trust the science and it's like people are so depressed right now. They're so anxious. They don't have money. They don't have social connection because of the isolation that we all have to do. And like, you can't just tell people trust the science. So I think we should trust the science, you know, whatever that means. But like, it, you should you need to speak to people's need, need for social connection and talk about how coming out of this pandemic, we're going to create a society of care and connection and community and do so in a way that is also sustainable environmentally, right? There's like a real opportunity to sort of message and frame around that that I think has been lost because of just deep individualism in the United States and how inflected liberalism is with that. Um, so I'm curious what, what others have to say, but I think we should talk more about happiness and community and relationships and how they're part of a Green New Deal. Absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, Naley. I think one of the most brilliant things that has come out of COVID-19 being such a horrible experience for a lot of people is mutual aid. And I think that has actually proven again 
communities are not like we need strong communities so that we're not waiting for government to respond and actually take care of us as much as communities actually have shown up for each other this year you know there have been groups popping up all over the world and in the country here where a lot of that mutual aid like that's grounded in community has actually helped a lot more people than you know the government subsidies or anything like that and so um, there's something uh, about the way that capitalism works that basically individualizes our struggles and our suffering. And the most radical thing we can do is actually like find collective power. So I think that that should be at the at the uh, the center of the Green New Deal or any sort of grassroots movement, community building, because that is probably the most threatening t thing to the status quo, that we are not seeing these bigger issues as our individual issues, or that the only way to fix them is our individual action, but rather a systemic overturn. And so I think that that's why the Green New Deal is such a powerful uh, proposal, because it actually understands those connections and it understands that it's, it, it understands the struggle at a systemic level and not an individual one. Um, and so I think that ultimately, if we, the way to pull more people into the movement into understanding things like why the Green New Deal is so important and radical and bold, um, is that it, it represents community and that it actually, you know, lets us build that up rather than what ca capitalism has taught us our entire lives, that it, it, it is an individual struggle and the only solution lies in our individual actions. Snaps that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely, this is, again, you know, I think the full grasp of an era of liberalism uh, really simping for big corporations, big banks, and Bay Street at a time when working people needed them the most. And it's like, don't tell me about your politics. Show me your budgets. Show me how you weigh your relationships in this country. And liberals at every step, as they do with climate change, you know, this idea that we can tax our way out or we can, you know, eliminate straws and it'll all go away. And I think they had a, had a, had a tweet about that, if I, if I recall, about being able to, you know, talk to a generation about how it is more than just individual consumption. And this is about a, a compelling alternative to capitalism. This is about an eco-socialist solution that is a compelling alternative to a system that would have sacrificed our seniors, that would have left out and neglected people living with disabilities, that would have simultaneously uh, detained and yet not supported non-Canadian workers here, non-citizen workers, migrant workers in this moment. The worst of capitalism has resulted in 12,000 people dying in this country. That is a fact, it is not a feeling. And so, you know, from my perspective, going back to my good friend Avi and the folks at The Leap, this idea that a caring economy includes and captures and dismantles the misogyny and patriarchy of capitalism that says people who are giving care to community deserve to be compensated. And that's why things like Leah's guaranteed basic livable income are so incredibly important to this transition, that we can do it, that it's all there that looking at the way we, we have sovereignty over our own spending and our own lending is there for us, but it's not gonna be given to us. It is certainly something we're gonna have to organize and take. Derek, um, some final words? Uh, that's fantastic from all three panelists. And I just wanted to thank you for, for joining us tonight. And this is the first of a series um, Samir and I have kind of conceived of a few more of these. I think the next one we're going to look at is healthcare and the pandemic. And um, Thea, we appreciate Bernie and everybody using Canada as an example to push for Medicare for all in the U.S. But really, this pandemic has shown that it, the dream of Tommy Douglas in the 60s and going back to the 40s, that's all incomplete. Like Medicare was all, always supposed to be dental care. It was always supposed to include elder care. Um, so we're going to look at like the limitations there. And just, I guess, adding to the comments on spirituality and kind of a care economy is just, we want to be internationalists in this series. Um, and we will always want to be internationalists when we're thinking about the pandemic or about the Green New Deal. But that's, that's a great thing about Thea's book as well on the Green New Deal. It follows the supply, supply chains of the green economy. Like, where's the lithium going to come from to make this big transition in the global north? It's going to come from underneath the lands of indigenous people. 
in the global south, it's gonna come from miners in the global south. Um, so we wanna be internationalists and like, why, ha why hasn't anyone in Canada talked about Kerala in India where they've handled the pandemic better than most European and North American states? Like, why do we not talk about East Asia where they've done so much better responding like the, um, you know, the, the state and our elite are incapable of learning. They're in this terminal state uh, of capitalism. We said late capitalism in the introduction, Samir. I prefer the term terminal capitalism as, as grim as that is. Like, I think that's what we're trying to get out of. So yeah, this series is just one attempt to, uh, to help people think through these issues. And um, yeah, I'll let Samir just say a little bit about what the Institute's hoping to do going forward. But thanks again to the panelists for, for being part of this first one. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Well, well, late can mean kind of late in the day, but it can also mean dead, <laughs> and and I think that that uh, you know certainly is is raised by the pandemic in 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 all senses of that word, um, and where, where it becomes, of course, no joking matter at all. Um, no, I think you've you've outlined very nicely what we uh, intend to do. Um, there will be more information posted uh, as we organize uh, these panels. So, so definitely um, check out our website. Uh, we've, we're on social media and you can also sign up to our mailing list so you get regular updates on what, what we're up to. Um, I'd really like to extend a special thank you to the panelists. I come away from this evening absolutely inspired by this uh, younger generation of, uh, of activists, politicians, intellectuals, academics. It's really been eye-opening and it's uh, uh, just been a phenomenal uh, um, session. I thank you very much um, for all of your contributions. Uh, I'd like to thank Derek for really um, not just doing a lion's share of this, he's, he's put it together uh, and so he deserves all of the credit. Thank you, Derek. Um, also, thank you to our, our audience. Um, had some really great um, uh, questions and comments. Uh, so thank you for, for um, taking uh, some valuable time to be with us. These are important discussions uh, and we want them to resonate uh, far and wide, um, not just within this country, but beyond it. We very much have an internationalist vision um, at the Institute uh, for the Humanities. So um, thanks again, have a, a great evening and uh, we will uh, see you again soon. Have a wonderful holiday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Shout out, shout out to Derek O'Keefe, man. Big fan of the work. Keep popping. Just <laughs> Matthew Green and the rest of the, the squad. Needs to get bigger. <laughs> Canadian squad. Thanks, Thea and Naily. Thanks, all. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye.